Kolkata, a comparatively young city, is only three centuries old. Yet in its checkered history, from a small hamlet into an imperial capital, it has assimilated many peoples, cultures and histories. Its unique synthesis spans across space and time. The modern rediscovery of the ancient knowledge of Asia that began here informed the wisdom and transformed the spirit of India today. That is the story I would like to share. On Christmas Eve, Park Street, the pulsating heart of the city, reminds us of several European nations that sailed down the Hooghly till the British remained to build their capital here. It is ironical that festive Park Street was once called the Old Cemetery Street or Burial Ground Road, a long forgotten fact. The only reminder is the 18th century cemetery at the fag end of the street. Many illustrious officers of the East India Company and members of their families died at a tender age in a climate hostile for them and they were buried here. The famous Orientalist Sir William Jones lies among them. With my personal journey into the history both of Jones and his contemporaries as well as the Asiatic society was my endeavour to discover the roots of one of the greatest intellectual movements that transported India into the modern age. For me, it was important to pay tribute at the mausoleum of Sir William Jones, founder of the Asiatic Society. The great institution that he created stands at the other end of the same street, the Asiatic Society, a treasure house of the knowledge of Asia. My discovery of its glorious and intriguing past crossed paths with a British girl with old family connections with India. I was looking for my intellectual lineage while she was searching for her personal roots. It was not difficult for the two to get intertwined. You know, however great the achievements of the Asiatic society have been, one must remember that the British were initially here as merchants and traders, with purely commercial interests rather than as imperialists. Yes, that's true. But by the time they settled down in India and began to trade, a great um, moment of historical transition had also arrived. How do you mean exactly? Well, the process of the decline of the Mughal Empire had begun and that created a huge power vacuum throughout the Indian subcontinent. And the East India Company seized the opportunity to grab power. Precisely. <laughs> but what did power grabbing have to do with scholarship? Oh, well, they had to understand the country and the people that they had to rule. And in the process, they unearthed a huge treasure of learning and in fact created a nucleus of learning, you know which has continued for the past 225 years. I suppose knowledge itself is imperative to colonial rule. Yes, knowledge is power. And the knowledge that they gave to India had been lost to the India of their times. In fact, its rediscovery helped to build the foundations of New India. But what prompted William Jones and his contemporaries? I suspect, Maya, that the answer to your question is in the life and times of Sir William Jones himself. So in order to understand that, one must take a look at the London and the England of his times. Times dominated by men like Sir Edmund Halley, whose discovery of the comet symbolized the Age of Enlightenment as much as Sir Isaac Newton, both friends of Jones's father. Of course, the falling of the prophetic apple had a lot to contribute. At school in Harrow, his remarkable academic flair extended beyond the usual Greek and Latin to French, Italian, Spanish and Portuguese. His gift for languages must have been quite phenomenal. Jones's intellectual prowess and literary skill became evident in his poem on the mythology of chess, composed both in English and Latin 
in 1763. He was still quite young, wasn't he? Just 17, and on his way to Oxford to study Oriental literature at the University College. By 1771, he had published a Persian grammar while he made efforts to learn Hebrew and Chinese. So how many languages did he actually speak? Sir William Jones was, in fact, what is called a hyperpolyglot. And what's that? Well, he knew 13 languages very well, and another 28 pretty well. But he read law at Oxford. That's right. As far as I remember, he was called to the bar in 1774 at the Middle Temple, and he went on to write about the philosophy of law. And that earned him a place at Judges Court in Wales, and then eventually in Calcutta at the Supreme Court in 1783. So it was somewhere around here that Sir William Jones first arrived in the late 18th century. Yes, almost exactly at the same spot, except for the skyline that was quite different. Well, obviously. But Kakara was already quite a bustling port by then. Yes, it was a bustling town as well. The Supreme Court where Sir William Jones was going to take his prestigious seat. And more importantly, he was bringing with him a vision and a dream. You mean his idea for the Asiatic Society? Much more than an idea. He was bringing a memorandum of an institution of Asiatic learning, which he had written on board the frigate, the crocodile, which brought him here from England. Jones wrote on his voyage to India that, when I was at sea last August, India lay before us and Persia on our left whilst the breeze from Arabia blew nearly on our stern. It gave me inexpressible pleasure to find myself in the midst of so noble an amphitheater, almost encircled by the vast regions of Asia, which has ever been esteemed as the nurse of sciences, the inventress of delightful and useful arts, fertile in the productions of human genius, I could not help remarking how important and extensive a field was yet unexplored, and when I considered that such inquiries could only be made by the united efforts of many, such a union could be effected among my countrymen in Bengal in laying the foundation of a society for inquiring into the history and antiquities, the natural productions, arts, sciences, and literature of Asia to convey knowledge to mankind. But surely there were already others like him who were here. I mean, you know, employees of the East India Company. Yes, there were. The company, in fact, had brought together distinguished men of learning who had great intellectual curiosity about the land where they had come to work. So what was unique about Jones's contribution? Well, Jones's contribution was unique in the sense that he brought a specific plan a kind of detailed outline of what was, in fact, a grand intellectual enterprise. So it all happened here, in the Grand Jury Room of the Supreme Court. Yes, 15th of January, 1784. William Jones had collected 30 of his peers to begin the inquiry into the discovery of the ancient learning of Asia, which he believed held the secret to the early history and civilization of mankind. Probably the minutes were signed here on this table.
So there must have been quite an impressive list of names following Sir William. Well, this was Warren Hastings who was collecting the best minds of his generation and bringing them here to Calcutta. And yes, and knowing how dictatorial men like Hastings could be, the Asiatic society could not have happened without his approval, surely. Well, I suppose you could say that. But however, uh, the guiding principle remained Jones's vision. The words that he wrote on board the ship to India became the guidelines for one of the greatest intellectual pursuits of mankind. See what he writes. You will investigate whatever is rare in the stupendous fabric of nature, will correct the geography of Asia by new observations and discoveries. You will trace the annals and even traditions of those nations who from time to time have peopled or desolated it. And you will bring to light their various forms of government and their institutions, civil and religious. Well, I think one of the keys to Jones's vision is right here in these lines. If now it be asked, what are the intended objects of our inquiries into these spacious limits? We answer, man and nature, what is produced by one and performed by the other. Yes, and he also said, and this is interesting, it may be advisable at first, in order to prevent any difference of sentiment on particular points not immediately before us, to establish but one rule, namely to have no rules at all. How amazing is that? The opposite is true today. Our conversation with the eminent historian, Professor Borun Dey, opened new windows of opportunity. Uh, Professor Dey, we would like to know from you specifically kind of role played by Warren Hastings and the later Governor Generals during the formative years of the Asiatic Society. Right. I think there is a certain dichotomy uh, in the formation of the Asiatic Society. There is, of course, the famous uh, emphasis on liberalism, the sort of liberalism with which the market economy and the moral sentiments of Adam Smith uh, is associated, and the way in which Sir William Jones has this pure and noble vision of encompassing the knowledge of a new continent which is going to come under the sway of the East India Company. Emphasis not being on sway, but emphasis being on knowledge. But there is the other side of what I think is essentially a dialectical relationship. And here you have the standards of the gaining of knowledge, which are related entirely with the authority of the state and the power of the state to fund and facilitate the spread of knowledge as power over nature, as well as over the subjects who populate nature, as well as over the productive capacity of those subjects and the way in which they dominate nature. The state is seen as the capstone of all this. Jones's greatest contribution to Sanskrit, I think, comes from his seminal translation of Kalidasa's Avigyan Shakuntalam. As you know, Goethe found lasting impact from Kalidas, and through that, Sanskrit had a kind of influence on the German academic world. In fact, German scholars continued and spearheaded the whole study of Sanskrit and discovered other layers and other areas of learning from ancient India. Be the crime removed from my soul. Thou has been instructed for some bare purpose to vilify me and make me fall from dignity which I have hitherto supported as a river which has burst its banks and altered its placid current overthrows the trees that have risen aloft of them. If thou sayest this merely for want of recollection, I will restore thy memory by producing thy own ring with thy name engraved on it. A capital invention! <laughs> uh, I have
have no ring. So skillful are women in finding ready excuses. However, Jones is really quite interesting in the sense that he moved away from Sanskrit to modern Indian languages like uh, Maithili, for instance, which is as melodic as Kalidasa's Sanskrit was uh, dramatic. And did he ever work with Maithili? Yes, yes. In fact, he translated the Gita Govinda, which is a popular lyrical romance. He was that serious, was he? <laughs> yes, I suppose he was serious. But, however, Jones did have the ability to express his literary interests in the light of Ain as well. Like what? Well, he had this pet tortoise whom he named Othello, probably because of its colour. And this namesake of Shakespeare's tragic hero would roam across probably his priceless manuscripts and notes on an academic discipline that Jones, in fact, gifted to the entire world. And what was that? Comparative philology. Jones, in fact, is the person who really put Sanskrit in a pivotal position in the entire Indo-European group of languages. At Oxford, William Jones had translated pre-Islamic Arabic poetry. His specialization in law resulted in significant books on Muslim personal law especially on the subject of inheritance. In India, he discovered a wealth of literature in languages beyond Sanskrit. Many of his translations introduced important literary works to the rest of the world, like the Gita Govinda from Maithili. Jones's interest in India encompassed a wide variety of subjects, like the Hindu lunar calendar, for instance. The musical modes of Hindu culture attracted his attention strongly enough for him to write a book about it. Of course, his book on chess was a kind of logical extension of his interest from school days. The width of his oeuvre is evident from his book on Indian plants, also a part of his collection of the knowledge of Asia. He not only collected the written word, but included available visual material of all kinds. Yes, I know he began the Asiatic Society's collection of books, documents, paintings and various artifacts at the Supreme Court in the Grand Jury Room. Perhaps no one personified this intellectual endeavour more than Sir William Jones. That's his obelisk towering over all the others in this cemetery, just like Jones himself, who towered over all his contemporaries. <laughs> Actually, his wife had been ill for quite a while and then had to return to England. And Jones promised her he'd follow her within two years at the most, but... Yes, he died rather suddenly on the 27th of April, 1794. Unfortunately, he had a sudden inflammation of the liver. Did you know, Maya, that the Brahmins of his time all got together for a ritual lamentation for him? How come? I think they considered him as one of their own. The Asiatic Society was only 10 years old at the time, and in such a short period, Jones had managed to start this process of discovery that continues today. Yes, it revealed new gems of knowledge and wisdom, and it inspired scholars of yesterday and today and hopefully tomorrow as well. I'm sure Jones didn't return home with his wife because of many unrealized plans and projects that he still had pending here. Well, his unrealized plans he wrote down in his own hand and he called it his Desiderata. It included Asia from Persia to China and even Tartary, but its pivotal center was India. Here it is, written by Jones himself. Here was deposited the mortal part of a man who feared God but not death and maintained independence but sought not riches, who thought none below him but the base and unjust 
none above him but the wise and virtuous, who loved his parents, kindred friends, country, with an ardor that was the chief source of all his pleasures and all his pains, and who having devoted his life to their service and to the improvement of his mind, resigned it calmly, giving glory to his Creator, wishing peace on earth and with goodwill to all creatures, on the 27th day of April, in the year of our blessed Redeemer, 1794. Such was the stature of Jones's genius that a kind of vacuum prevailed at the Asiatic society immediately after his death. But Jones had chosen his compatriots well and his incomplete task was taken up by his co-founder, Henry Thomas Colebrook. Colebrook's scholarly intervention in his duties of a faithful Hindu widow remains an example of the far-reaching implications of the Asiatic society's role as a catalyst by unearthing information that inaugurated social change. The most dramatic, of course, was the issue of sati, the prevalent custom of burning Hindu widows alive in their husband's funeral pyres. Colebrook's significant knowledge of Sanskrit made him the first to object to this inhuman practice as early as 1790. His objections were based on the comparative study of manuscripts where texts had been misrepresented and consequently misinterpreted. It was only with Ram Mohan's intervention, four decades later, that Sati was legally banned after a huge social movement that divided the Hindu society. The enumeration of Indian classes, Indian weights and measures, and subjects like the Indian Arabic zodiac were included among Colebrook's other significant social and commercial studies. The manuscripts and other artifacts that Jones began to collect with help from many others he had inspired, had grown significantly. And obviously the grand jury room of the Supreme Court eventually became inadequate to store it all. Absolutely. And you must remember that meanwhile, Calcutta too was growing as a commercial, administrative and intellectual centre, fueled by the ambitious plans of Warren Hastings and the East India Company. And what about the Asiatic Society? The first three editions of Asiatic Researches found so much worldwide recognition that at least two pirated versions were widely circulated. Well, it certainly was a kind of tribute to the quality of scholarship and the width of its choice of subject matter. True. With growing expectations, the Asiatic Society defined its future early enough. The need for its permanent home soon became urgent and the fast-growing city had little space to accommodate it. The immediate hinterland of Calcutta still had isolated locations where Warren Hastings hunted Royal Bengal Tigers. Now, the St. Paul's Cathedral is located there. That's surprising. It shows how far the Sundarbans were spread. The Maidan was an open space around the new Fort William for obvious military reasons used by the army for equestrian exercises, it had a riding school run by an Italian instructor. Its stables at the edge of the Maidan attracted attention when the search began in earnest to house the Asiatic society. It was a matter of time and inevitable circumstance that the Asiatic society found its first home here at number one Park Street. Unbelievable, isn't it? This was one of the secluded, lonely corners of the city. 
Look at it now. Yes, the palanquin bearers would charge extra money to bring someone here. So the Asiatic Society building must have looked very grand at that time. Yes, in fact, it was the city's first and grandest public building. I see. Designed by Captain Thomas Preston, who was in fact a member of the Asiatic Society. And it was built by many celebrated builders who collaborated on this, including a very famous French builder called Jean-Jacques Pichon, right. among others. Okay. You can barely see it now. <laughs> So the Asiatic society must have had quite the impact on the cultural life of Calcutta's intellectual population in those days. Why only Calcutta? In fact, if you look at the unique position that the Asiatic society held, it attracted men of learning and letters from all corners of Asia and Europe as well. So in a sense, Europe's Age of Enlightenment traveled here with William Jones and his contemporaries. Yes, I suppose you could say that. In fact, it not only came here, but it took very deep roots and it flowered. And as a result, it engaged the entire intellectual community, not only of its own times, but that of centuries after. Well, I guess one must keep in mind certain geophysical factors about Calcutta. What do you mean? The fact, for instance, that the British, like other Europeans, had to reach Calcutta after arduous and difficult voyages across turbulent seas, like the Bay of Bengal. And it required considerable maritime skills and experience that the British did have. Yes, some of my forefathers, in fact, had been sea captains of considerable repute. And they would certainly have been men of intellect and learning, I'm sure, because maritime and navigational skills demand a certain scientific bent of mind. So even sailors who came here found their way to the Asiatic Society? Anyone, in fact, with an inquiring mind came to the Asiatic Society for that is where his spirit of inquiry would be honoured, nurtured and acknowledged by his peers. I've heard of Biddington. Apparently he was the first person to coin the term cyclone. Yes, of course, he did a lot more than that. He was, in fact, a ship captain with considerable experience in the South China Sea and the Bay of Bengal, captaining the ship mm -hmm. that belonged to the East India Company. And he came to Calcutta in 1830, after his sailing days were over and retired. He then published his experiences. Yes, in fact, he did quite a lot. I mean, he wrote the Horn Book of the Law of Storms, in which he contributed significantly of his understanding of um, the infant science of meteorology. He continued to work on the subject, didn't he? Yes, he did. In 1848, he published the second edition of his book, and that was considered even more widely as an international textbook on the subject. Did he ever work on anything else? Yes, he worked in botany, he worked in soil chemistry, and in fact, he discovered the whole potential for the sub-Himalayan soil for Sincona plantation. And presumably this was all published by the Asiatic Society. Yes, in its magazine called The Gleanings in Science. Do you know who its editor was? Who? <laughs> James Princep. That doesn't surprise me. The spirit of Sir William Jones, with his widespread scholarly interests and aptitude that matched depth with dimension, continued in others like James Princep. Princep was as a master of the Banaras Mint, where he took India's first scientific meteorological readings at regular intervals 
with a barometer for altitude measurements as early as 1828. Princep exhibited a wide range of scientific interests and skills, from architecture to urban development. He restored the minarets in Aurangzeb's scrambling mosque on the riverbank. He even made statistical surveys of the city. Princeps, countless splendid drawings of one of India's oldest cities, remain examples of the gamut of his interests and his skills. Princep's scientific mind prompted him to analyze the well water available in the city and it led him to redesign the drainage system of Banaras. In a sense, he was preparing himself for larger goals he would pursue once he came to Calcutta. His acumen in architecture was again evinced in Calcutta as the assay master of its new mint since 1819. In fact, as architect of the Calcutta Mint, he has left for posterity an example of his consummate genius. He designed and fabricated a new assay balance that could measure metals with an accuracy unknown before him. This helped him in his introduction of uniform coinage, another pioneering landmark in his times. It was only a small step from the minting of coins to the study of numismatics. He identified three evolutionary stages of minting, from punch-marked and die-struck to cast coins. Coins provided Princep with the pathway to learning ancient and forgotten texts like Karoshti, Princep went further to unlock the secrets of the Brahmi script and to decipher the Ashokan edicts. At least one of the many dreams that Sir William Jones had held close to his heart was realized within half a century of his death. The edicts, discovered in the sands of the Rajasthan desert, had great impact on the study of Indian history. Princep's breakthrough in deciphering Brahmi had monumental significance the long-forgotten historical content of Emperor Ashoka's rule revealed a whole new vision of India's Buddhist past. Princep's great discoveries came during his tenure as the secretary of the Asiatic Society and the editor of its journal, most of them within 1833 to 1838. In the words of Dr. Hugh Faulkner, James Princep was one of the most talented and useful men that England had given to India. The location of this monument is fascinating. I love how the old is juxtaposed with the new. The colonial in the foreground and the contemporary behind it. Yes, in fact, it's quite an incredible landmark in the city. And it's been there for quite a long time. Princep, as you know, died rather early when he was about 41 years old, on the 22nd of April, 1840. And in just one year's time, in 1841, his friends and admirers had got together to build this to honor his memory, the memory of a great scientist, a great scholar, and a great gentleman. 
It's very interesting to remember that the Princep Monument is really not one of those which have been built to glorify the British Raj, but rather to pay homage to an extraordinary human being by his friends and admirers. And that is what I think makes it so precious and so important and so quite distinct from all the other pieces of colonial architecture that we have in the city. The intellectual energy of Princep inspired us to follow his antiquarian trail to new archaeological sites like Mughalmari. Do badhiya chai. <laughs> Your Bengali has certainly improved. <laughs> this is in fact published by the Asiatic Society, you know. It's got a technical report on the excavations at Mughalmari. Gosh, it's so beautiful here. Mm. This river is beautiful. In fact, it also has a beautiful name. Which is? Shuvarnarekha. The golden line. In fact, it does trace a golden line in Indian civilization because it has a series of Buddhist settlements here. So Mughalmari presumably was on the banks of the same river. It was. In fact, the river has shifted and Mughalmari is now about three or four kilometers inland. Right. But there are other settlements. And probably the early Buddhists came here because it was secluded, it was lonely, it was peaceful and because they were left alone to kind of follow their faith. But water, as you it's know, has always, yes. it's always been the beginning and the cradle of human settlements. Looking at this, it seems like a very small part of what was obviously a much larger site. I mean, this looks like an outer wall of a monastery. In fact, the paved pathway that you find under our feet is obviously the kind of pathway along which the monks used to walk when they did their parikrama right. along with other devotees around the entire monastery site. So there's obviously a lot of scope for ex further excavation. Absolutely. And Absolutely. looking at this stucco, it seems quite typical of Buddhist architecture, particularly monastery architecture. Yeah, I'm not surprised that you've noticed this because you have an architectural eye, so if you look at the stucco pieces here, uh, you will find that they have a lot in common with uh, other Buddhist monasteries like Nalanda and Vikramshila, for instance. Especially look at the, look at the floral patterns. They're really quite uh, identifiable. It is indeed quite significant that it is the same Zhuanzang document on the basis of which Dr. Debola Mitro, the famous archaeologist and director of the Archaeological Survey of India, had pointed out to this place and the possibility of a major archaeological find here. Right. And, uh, you know, and... Uh, it, uh, but the actual excavation itself took many decades after Dr. Mitra's... And it's still nowhere near complete. No, no, at all, not at all. In, in fact, uh, only in 2004, the Calcutta University archaeologists came here under the leadership of Dr. Rashuk Dutta for the first time. Mm -hmm. And they have just made the initial first foray. And they have laid out the kind of uh, parameters, perhaps, of what further remains to be discovered. Mm -hmm. What is, of course, very interesting and very intriguing is that it is the same Suanjang document that had inspired and had given the clue to Sir Alexander Cunningham to discover oh, yeah. Bodh Gaya. Yes. You know, that's, that's very uh, significant that the Asiatic Society was still involved with that 150 All years, ago, years ago. Exactly. And uh, they still continue to do it here. Men like Princep who followed him were discovered among the company's traders, soldiers, and administrators, all of them inspired in their quest to discover the forgotten traces of Indian history. To unearth treasures, they went east, west, 
north and south. Leadership came from the disciples of James Princep, like Sir Alexander Cunningham, a military engineer with considerable technological skills and resources, inspired with a passion for the past. Bodhgaya, the place of Buddha's enlightenment, was discovered and excavated in 1883 by Cunningham. The original layout had been largely destroyed and the architectural signs of the most sacred of Buddhist sites lay in ruins. With his dedicated band of restorers, Cunningham put together the entire site piece by piece, largely guided by the descriptions of the ancient Chinese pilgrims, Fashian in the 5th century and Zhuanzang in the 7th. Rajendra Lalomitra of the Asiatic Society was among the historians who contributed to this task of reconstructing history, an example of how Indian scholars had come to contribute to the rediscovery of ancient Indian learning. Saranath is another of Alexander Cunningham's great discoveries of Buddhist sites. Located six kilometers from the ancient town of Varanasi, this was where the Buddha began the preaching of his religion after his enlightenment. There are many legends and myths that Sarnath is associated with. The facts, however, indicate that Buddha taught his first five disciples the fundamentals of the faith at the famous deer park. Cunningham located it in a forest that covered the entire area from contemporary records. The stupa, which includes the Ashokan pillar, which stands decapitated today, was once crowned by the famous original sandstone sculpture of the three lions, the national emblem of India, not only by its antiquity, but also its philosophical significance. Sanchi was discovered in 1818, but its proper reconstruction began as late as 1912. It is believed to contain the remains of the Buddha and is venerated among devout Buddhists from all corners of the world. In Sanchi, the temple depicts human figures in Greek attire. Clothing, musical instruments and other elements indicate a distinct Hellenic presence. The historical possibilities it unearths are many. The conjectures continue. Unanswered questions remain. The four Toranas, ornamental gateways, represent love, peace, trust and courage. Universal values celebrated across time and borders. One of the major projects of the Archaeological Survey of India, Nalanda demonstrates the passion and the precision of Cunningham and his dedicated band of scholars and technical people. Nalanda, one of the first great universities in recorded history, was another major archaeological work that left us with greater understanding of Buddhist learning and scholarship in ancient India. Existing from the 5th to the 12th centuries, it attracted students from Greece to China. Many schools of Tibetan Buddhism have protected the thoughts and ideas that grew in Nalanda. Historians believe that through scholars of the Mahayana tradition, Nalanda kept growing through the 6th and 9th centuries. There are few greater monuments to peace than the 3rd century BC rock edicts of Dholi in Odisha that document Emperor Ashoka's terrifying experience of the horrors of war. Without Princeps' discovery of the Brahmi script and the scholarship of Rajendra Lalo Mitru, its forgotten text would not have revealed its significance for civilization which was tremendous and the content for the Buddhist faith which was overwhelming. Also in Odisha, the rock 
rock-cut caves of Udayagiri and Khandagiri, rediscovered in 1825, presents a wealth of information through its countless inscriptions, friezes and wall paintings. Excavated during the time of Emperor Koravala, the caves were obviously created to house Jain ascetics in a monastery that imparted training in Jain theology. Some caves show connections with Buddhism as well. Its revelation is directly linked to the support of the Asiatic society and the inspiration of Princip. Visual documentation of many other sites of religious and historical importance was carried out throughout the subcontinent. It leaves us with a wealth of visual description that required great patience and skill, all of which were carefully collected by the Asiatic society long before photography had come. The Elephanta Caves, located in the Arabian Sea, near Mumbai, contain high reliefs in stone of Hindu deities important to the worshippers of Shiva. Created during the late Gupta Empire, the caves are thought to date back to the 9th and 13th centuries. The Trimurti shows three faces of Shiva, almost a kidden to Brahma, Vishnu and Mahesh. Perhaps one of the most valuable collections of our Buddhist past is here in the Barut Stones, a major discovery by Alexander Cunningham. He brought them all here to the Indian Museum and reassembled them, probably inspired by the Elgin marbles in the British Museum. The Barut Stupa may have been established by the Maurya King Ashoka in the 3rd century BC with additions made during the 2nd century. The stupa contains numerous Jataka tales in the shape of large round medallions with the Buddha represented through symbols. The characters are in Indian clothes except the Indo-Greek soldier along with the Buddhist symbols. Since the Buddha was never shown in person, symbols denote his presence. Texts identifying characters are an unusual feature of the Bharut inscriptions. Treasures like the Barut stones in the Indian Museum bring us back to the Asiatic society which served as a matrix of a number of priceless collections of historical and scientific data. In fact, the process that Sir William Jones had begun in the Grand Jury Room of the Supreme Court eventually culminated in what we see here today as the Indian Museum. In fact, the man who created the first modern museum in Asia in that sense of the word in 1814 was also an exemplary and fascinating character from 19th century India. Another Englishman, I presume? No, on the contrary, he was a Dane. A Danish botanist trained at the University of Copenhagen, a Jewish doctor, Nathaniel Wallach. How did he get here? Well, he was in the employ of the Danish East India Company in Sirampur. They had a settlement a few miles up the river. Uh -huh. And he was working there in botany till the British decided to throw the Danes out. And he got imprisoned as a prisoner of war. <laughs> My goodness. And then what happened to him? Well, he must have spent about six months in his prison cell wondering when he was ever going to make that great discovery of Indian flora. Mm -hmm. But he was rescued finally by his reputation as a scientist. Okay. Ah, in fact, the director of the Botanical Gardens, Sir William Roxburgh, who personally rescued him. 
Right, and brought him here. That's right. Yes, I'm sure after a prison cell, coming here to this vast open space must have been hugely liberating. I can't believe how well this building has survived for over 200 years. Considering it's right on the banks of the river. It's amazing. It's the residence of an equally amazing man. Sir William Roxburgh, a contemporary of Sir William Jones, the father of Indian botany, and one of the early scientists who looked upon the Asiatic society as the only place where they could find an eager audience for the kind of work that they were doing in terms of research. And I think the Asiatic society plays a very vital role in the development and the honing of skills in their domains of knowledge. There are a lot of scientists like this who have really depended upon the Asiatic society to develop huge areas of understanding and also an appreciative audience for the kind of research and the kind of pains that they were really taking. The drawings of Indian flora and the specimens preserved by both Roxburgh and Wallach laid firm foundations for the modern study of Indian botany. The dedication of those early pioneers and the encouragement they found from the Asiatic society becomes apparent in every page and in every leaf that they touched. Wallach's catalogue has in fact remained a major source of scientific data. Significantly, this furthered the efforts by Jones to give Indian botanical names at a time when Latin was the accustomed language for scientific use. The Asiatic Society Museum, pioneered by Dr. Nathaniel Wallach in 1814, was not only the forerunner, but also the matrix, out of which the Indian Museum was born half a century later, with the Indian Museum Act of 1862. However, the museum was housed in its present home more than a decade later, in 1878, ten years after the Asiatic Society had transferred all its assets. The Geological Survey of India was directly linked to the Asiatic Society through the early pioneers who collected samples from across the subcontinent and studied the geophysical aspects of India in its bewildering variety. The museum's geological samples had great impact on India's economy like coal mining in the Raniganj coal fields. The Asiatic Society Museum jealously guarded its pioneering role as the first of its kind in this part of the world. It opened the doors to technology and entrepreneurship, both major motive forces that powered the arrival of our modern world. But it is amazing to think of the painstaking research that went into it for years before the earlier steps could be taken.
British capital rubbed shoulders with Indian capital in the new opportunities that were opened up. A reminder that Prince Dwarkanath Tagore, the poet Rabindranath's grandfather, was one of the most enthusiastic of Indian businessmen, came from the abandoned house of Carr, Tagore and Company. Even if we have been able to preserve some of our ancient history, our more recent past will be obliterated even faster. The magic of the steam engine changed the face of India in a way that could not have been envisaged. And what we are left with are the benefits that we have accrued as a nation from the spread of technology, whose first giant step was in creating faster communication lines across the subcontinent. The Indian Museum also reminds us that the Asiatic society had taken leadership in the discovery of India's varied and fascinating anthropology, a subject that continues to demand strong academic interest, both within the country and worldwide. Often called the anthropologist's paradise, India is home to countless tribes at different stages of human development. Their study is a key to understanding Asia and ourselves. As a serious lover of nature, Sir William Jones had serious objections, not only to keeping animals in captivity, but also to killing them for scientific reasons. However, zoology was a major thrust area among the early members of the Asiatic Society. Almost from its inception, people have flocked to the museum out of sheer curiosity about the world they live in. The cultivation of India's arts and sciences by the Asiatic society was both widespread and deep-rooted. Much like the famous banyan tree here at the Botanical Gardens in Shippur. If you wish to see it as a symbol, then perhaps it is an appropriate symbol of Sir William Jones's vision and dream of unearthing the science and the history of India and Asia. You could also see it as a symbol of the Asiatic Society's role as an advisory body to the government of India, which left a deep impact both in its depth of scientific research and in its width of other institutions of different scientific domains of knowledge that it helped to create. The Trigonometrical Society in 1818, the Geological Survey in 1850, the Archaeological Survey in 1862, the Indian Meteorological Department in 1875, the Botanical Survey in 1890, the Zoological Survey in 1911, the Linguistic Survey in 1928, and the Anthropological Survey at different times of its history. Other institutions became possible because of the society and its members, like the University of Calcutta's natural choice for the first Vice-Chancellor was the President of the Asiatic Society, Chief Justice Sir James William Colville. Men of science like Sir Leonard Rogers formed the School of Tropical Medicine in 1914. Its location in Calcutta was the result of a sustained campaign for Sir Leonard's plan led by the Asiatic Society. Professor Day, how would you interpret uh, Asiatic Society's response to a political and social environment in which it was, or the society? how it was responding or interacting with the society around it. Yeah, I think it reflected the social changes of the time. In the 1780s, there was what has recently been called by a very bright young scholar, lecturer in history in King's College London, John Wilson, a period of anxiety. He is using a term which he has taken very consciously from an article in 1997 by Ranajit Guha, in which Ranajit Guha 
looks at the British imperial presence in Bengal and in India in general and Burma as well as a tension and anxiety about whether they are acceptable or not. The British are seen as people who are a super group, a heron folk, a master race, who are accepted as such by the people, but not without a sense of resistance. There is always this sense of resistance and there is always on the part of uh, the British imperial ruler a feeling of anxiety about what the role of an empire builder should be. Guha interpreted it in his article in terms of Yates Brown's Lives of a Bengal Lancer or George Orwell's Shooting an Elephant and the way that the ruler looks at the rule half resentful, half acceptive. I think that that was the way the Asiatic society also looked at the people of India as subjects, subjects in law certainly, but subjects also in terms of modern literary theory. The subjects of okay. attention on whom an imperial gaze was directed. To take a cue from what you were telling us, how exactly did the Asiatic society respond to major political events like 1857? Call it the Sepoy Mutiny, call it the First War of Independence. I would say that in general, the society concerned itself with an apparent impartiality. That is the mark of liberalism and neoliberalism. Everything is supposed, underline supposed, underline again supposed, to be value-free. The Society Secretary, Dr. Horace Heyman Wilson, defended Oriental scholarship from colonial attack. He drew together Indians like Ram Komal Sen, the first Indian Secretary of the Society, and the Tagores, both Prince Dwarkanath and Prashunnu Kumar, and academics like Roshomoy Dottu. I'm curious that Raja Ram Mohan Roy chose not to be a member of the Asiatic Society, despite his knowledge of Arabic, Persian and Sanskrit and English. Well, I think Ram Mohan probably subscribed to the Benthamite view that the old Asiatic Society was far too Orientalist in its, in its programs and its activities. In fact, at the other end of the spectrum in Calcutta's intellectual life at that time is De Rosio and the Young Bengal. They too did not participate in the Asiatic Society, probably because they thought that this was not the space that they wished to occupy in the intellectual movement of the times. Since 1801, the Fort William College encouraged Oriental scholars like Charles Wilkins, Nathaniel Halhead, and Jonathan Duncan. The intellectuals that Warren Hastings had brought to Calcutta played a vital role at the Asiatic Society. Sirampur, upstream from Calcutta, was a Danish settlement where the English Baptists' theological college was a major center of learning. Between 1800 to 1832, the Mission Press had printed a staggering 212,000 books in 45 languages till it went bankrupt. William Carey and Joshua Marshman translated the Bible which the printer William Ward published in Bengali and later in major Indian languages. W. H. Pierce and his Baptist Mission Press added to the efforts at Sirampur from 1818. By 1837, they were forced to combine. Over a century, the Baptist Mission Press printed in different Asian languages from Pushto to Burmese for the Asiatic Society. In the first 50 years of its existence, the Asiatic Society had already earned a formidable reputation. And that attracted scholars from all over the world. Incidentally, they were not all British. Who are you thinking of? Well, there he is. A Hungarian linguist who walked all the way to India 
in search of his native Magyar country. He walked? Yes. Alexander Choma de Koros. He walked from Turkey through Persia, Central Asia and Afghanistan, right into India. He had travelled along arduous routes from the heart of Europe to the roof of the world, and he arrived in Ladakh thanks to the protection of the British, who were leading players in the great game. Tibetan culture was deeply embedded in Ladakh, and de Koros began his study of the language. His collection of manuscripts contained rich literature. The inhospitable climate or his paltry resources did not distract the great personal sacrifice demanded by his pioneering and seminal research. So how did Decorus come to the Asiatic Society? Well, with his huge personal collection of Tibetan manuscripts, Koros realized that he had nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have the money to set himself up either. So he wrote to Dr. Horace Wilson, who was then secretary of the Asiatic Society, and asked for refuge and financial help. I guess the Asiatic Society under Princip had the academic climate that helped De Koros to perfect his knowledge of other classical languages. Like Sanskrit, from which many of the Tibetan texts were translated. So did he ever travel to Tibet again? Yes, he went thrice. And every time he came back with more precious Tibetan manuscripts and canonical texts. De Koros had the passionate determination required to penetrate the isolation of Tibet landlocked by almost impassable mountains. While his search for his homeland was in his thoughts, he engaged himself to discover forgotten, almost hidden examples of a great civilization that the world had never known about. Decorus in Tibet and Ladakh was in search of nothing more precious than words, the stepping stones to one of the most closely guarded cultures of the world. His personal notes included 30,000 carefully collected words of the Tibetan language and hundreds of manuscripts that he had collected from the monasteries of Ladakh and Tibet. Alexander Choma de Koros lived inside the Asiatic society because it was an obvious shelter for a man without a home dedicated to the task of revealing the treasures of Tibetan texts. They formed the basis of his first Tibetan English dictionary that was published by the Asiatic Society in 1834. It opened the doors to unlock the mystery that was Tibet. Decorus learned other modern Indian languages and contributed hugely as a librarian at the Asiatic Society. It is said that the reclusive Decorus hardly left his room in the Asiatic Society building. So Decorus certainly came to the right place. Yes, but you know, his dream of his Magyar homeland never left him and he tried again in 1842 to go back across the Himalayas. In fact, the intrepid traveller had in a sense found his final destination. The call of Tibet remained and he eventually made his last venture. The rigours of travel and the attack of malaria that he had in the Himalayan foothills took unfortunate toll, and his long search ended abruptly on a misty day. Decorus struggled valiantly up to the home of Joseph Campbell. The lovely mountain resort of Darjeeling was to be the starting point on his last journey in search of his homeland. Decorus died en route to the place he wanted to go ever since he had left home 30 years ago.
I remember seeing his grave in Darjeeling. Then you'll never forget the epitaph. Yes, a poor lonely Hungarian, without applause or money, sought the Hungarian native country, but in the end broke down with the burden. Yes, the Magyar homeland remained a myth to decorous. But the great reality that he left for posterity was the revelation of the Tibetan Buddhism. Without his dictionary, the world would never have known a culture and a religious faith that continues to surprise us. Did it gain him any recognition outside of academic circles? Intriguingly, it did, though much later in time. Uh -huh. And it came surprisingly from Japan. Oh. The Japanese Buddhists gave him the status of the Bodhisattva, a saint revered by all believers. It was he who had taken the message of Tibetan Buddhism to the whole world. Men of ideas and letters in India and Hungary have forged one of the strongest bonds in the memory of Decorus and his example, enriched by his valuable work in discovering a forgotten civilization. Today we are in a globalized world, a world in which East and West must meet, must understand each other. And Choma is the person who already 200 years ago started this job to do to understand the other culture, the other, other. He was a Christian, but he has written about Buddhism with great understanding. So this is a very important lecture which we have to learn for survive the 21st century as well. Indian scholar Sharod Chandra Das was largely inspired by the example and the work of Decorus. He too braved the difficult terrain and the people who had carefully guarded their culture for years to add significantly to the work on Tibetan language and culture. Mughal architecture in itself articulated the philosophical and mystical content of the ideas of the time. Sufism was a major intellectual influence, expressed as much through music as architecture, through the use of space and its myriad meanings. Persian and Arabic texts of the Mughal era continued to be a major interest for Asiatic scholars. Translations produced with care, analysis of historical documents and in-depth research contributed to a wider and more penetrating study of the achievements of the Mughal dynasty. Much of this path-breaking work appeared in major Asiatic society publications like the Bibliotheca Indica series. The Kutub Minar is celebrated as an architectural wonder in India, but it has many other aspects of historical value. A pre-Mughal construction, the Kutub Minar contains many stones with earlier Buddhist and Hindu inscriptions on their reverse. It seems obvious that these were collected from existing religious sites and reused. What remains hidden may be of equal importance. The Oshokan pillar and edicts, however, remain visible proof of pre-Islamic presence in the region.
The Mughal Empire had left a huge amount of historical literature because they had employed professional Persian chroniclers who left accurate and detailed descriptions of the intellectual, military and administrative environment of Mughal rule. Asiatic society publications have held it up to the world. Contributions and historical sources included a vast range of subjects from contemporary affairs of state to philosophy to poetry and to descriptions of myriad facets of life in different corners of the world. Asiatic society took the responsibility to collect as many manuscripts that they could access, but its role as an academic institution drove them forward to publish many important treatises, particularly in English translations, for a wider readership and research. Sir Jodhunath Sharkar, whose pursuit of historical accuracy and objectivity changed the way we look at our past. The new light he shed on Shivaji and Aurangzeb's fundamentalism indicated the disempowerment of pre-British India. Objectivity again could not prevent his disclosure of Aurangzeb's donations to Hindu religious institutions. In interpreting Sufism and understanding what later came to be known as subaltern history, makes him a pioneer in thought. Among leading Indian scholars at the society was Rajendra Lalo Mitru, the first Indian president in 1885. The Bengal Atlas captured the interest of Indian academics like Rajendra Lalo Mitru, they also opened new doors to ancient Indian learning, path-breaking European scholars and Indian scholars contributed both to the study of arts and sciences. The range of the Asiatic society in the first century of its existence is indicated in the centenary review compiled by Rajendra Lalo Mitro. These walls of the Asiatic society have so many stories to tell. Yes, I'm sure. But I'm particularly intrigued by Vidya Sagar, whose portrait we see here. Ah, you must have heard of the shoe scandal then. Vaguely, but I'm not quite sure what happened. Well, Vidya Sagar was an eminent scholar of Sanskrit. He was a famous educationist, a social reformer, and the principal of the famous Sanskrit college. Yes, and I believe he had quite close links with British educationists like Pithu. Yes, in fact, the British administration always took his advice on educational matters. So then what happened here at the Asiatic Society? Quite simply, he was disallowed from entering a meeting of the society because his sandals were considered inappropriate. And of course, Vidyashago refused to wear anything else. Well, quite rightly. That's <laughs> ridiculous. And so <laughs> colonial. I suppose he severed his links with the Asiatic society following that. I'm sure he had his pride. Yes, he had his pride. And no, he did not sever links with the Asiatic society. Mm -hmm. But why? Well, that is the dichotomy with which the history of the old Asiatic society is so full of. You see, though they had not allowed Vidyashagur to enter the meeting, they assigned him a very major project of collating and editing a Sanskrit manuscript. Why? Well, because for that project, his tremendous excellence in the language was heavily demanded. And he accepted? Yes, not only did he accept it, he in fact credited himself excellently. You see, this is what I've often wondered. How it is that despite the social conflict of the rulers and the ruled, both of them had no problem in respecting and understanding each other's academic and intellectual pursuits. If one looks at the long heritage of great scholars who have worked with the manuscripts in the Asiatic society, from Rajendra Lala Mitra and Prashad Shastri and other great names, you uh, see yourself or you find yourself in a heritage of great scholars and great scholarship. So far as I know, the earliest collection of manuscripts in the Asiatic society 
who had Persian and Arabic manuscripts, who were deciphered by the English scholars who knew Persian and Arabic. But later on, many Sanskrit manuscripts and Bengali manuscripts were collected from different parts of Bengal and different parts of India and even from Nepal. And then the work of two great experts, Bengali experts, Rajendra Lalo Mitra and Harapuja Shastri uh, began to be effective here in, uh, in, the, in, in, in the preparation of catalogues. They prepared the catalogue in a descriptive manner. That means firstly the manuscript, then the subject of the manuscript, and then quotations from the manuscript, illustrative quotations from the manuscript, the colophon, etc., etc., and they gave a total uh, description of the manuscript itself. Harupushat Shastri continued the work of Rajendra Lalo Mitra in collecting priceless and virtually forgotten Sanskrit manuscripts from all over India and Nepal. The archival interest in Asiatic society that began with William Jones himself continued along two centuries of its history. British collectors from all over Asia and later Indian scholars scouting across India unearthed a huge and varied number of handwritten texts in a range of Asian languages from Tibetan to Newari, from Sinhala to Oriya, from Armenian to Siamese. The range and content of this collection is a huge intellectual and antiquarian challenge. Its content is equally intriguing from religious and canonical texts to poetic narratives of myths and legends to biographies of historical characters like Jesus Christ. Many of them contain invaluable examples of ancient Indian scientific research. Much of this knowledge was lost to us for centuries and it is their rediscovery that has allowed our access to them. Some of the texts have been translated and published in the Bibliotheca Indica series and in Asiatic society journals over its two centuries of publishing history. What first drew me to Metcalf Hall was its stunning architecture. And once I walked inside, I found a treasure house of text and visual documentation where the archives of the Asiatic Society's publications and other journals have been stored. These include a wealth of scientific material which preserve a significant volume of work done over 220 years. I'm sure there are other gems waiting to be discovered here on a variety of different subjects. I was rather surprised that there weren't as many people as I would have been happy to see here. The word probably hasn't got round yet, or it's believed that the treasures are strictly for specialists. It's true that there are plenty of anatomical drawings here. Of course, I can't judge how correct they are, but one can't avoid being impressed by the phenomenal drawing skills. The rise of Indian scientists in the early 20th century was directly linked to the Asiatic society because of the ambience it had created for scientific learning. It was the only institution prepared to encourage and examine new ideas in science as well as the rediscovery of old ones. The Indian scientist Jagadish Chandra Bosch devoted himself to pure research from 1894. In 1895, a year before Marconi patented the invention of wireless telegraphy, he had demonstrated publicly how it functioned. Unfortunately, Jagadish Bosch missed out on the international patent. Disappointed, Jagadish Bosch later switched from physics to the study of metals and then plants. He founded the Boshu Bigyan Mandir at Calcutta devoted mainly to the study of plants. This followed Jagadish Chandra Bosch experiments that showed plants to have life. He invented an instrument to record the pulse of plants and connected it to a plant.
Many early pioneers in science were also builders of institutions, like the scientist and teacher Prafull Chandra Rai, who built Bengal Chemical to take the benefits of chemical and medical research to the masses. The mathematician and educationist Ashutosh Mukherjee was closely associated with the Asiatic society, which contributed heavily to academics in many ways. Radhanath Shikdar was part of the survey of India's team working in the Eastern Himalayas in 1852, when his calculations led to the discovery of the world's highest mountain, later named after his boss. The Asiatic society brought together the best minds of every generation, like the Nobel laureate C. V. Raman. Physicist Shruten Bosch and people from other disciplines like the linguist Shuniti Kumar Chattopadhyay. The path-breaking work of physician Dr. U. N. Brahmachari on the remedy for dreaded Kalazar was first published in Asiatic Society journals. Statistician P. C. Mohalanubish was the meteorologist in the Alipur Observatory till 1926. In 1927, he performed extensive anthropometric statistical analyses. His efforts from his own home finally culminated in the Indian Statistical Institute in 1931. Meghnath Shah began as a teacher of quantum physics at the University of Calcutta from 1917 with other young Indian scientists like Shottin Bose. His work on the ionization formula in the American Astrophysical Journal opened doors to research in Britain and Germany. A nationalist at heart, he returned to build the Shah Institute of Nuclear Physics. His international experience had opened his vision and he knew that the new India would need this knowledge for nation building. So, you have the same tradition going on. The Asiatic society is the mother of these ideas. But people are now beginning to develop it on their own. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, who declared the Asiatic society as an institution of national importance during its bicentenary in 1984, said, history had no holiday. I congratulate the Asiatic society on this birthday. It has done much for our country and for the world of learning. Some institutions reflect history and some contribute to it. The society has done both. Through its work, it revealed India's cultural and intellectual achievements to Europe. When we were enveloped in doubt and difficulties, it let in a ray of light. To our own people, this meant a rediscovery of our heritage and restored our self-respect. On the occasion of its 225th anniversary, the Asiatic Society was graced by India's President Srimati Pratibha Patil. The Asiatic Society initiated scientific investigations into the different fields of humanities and science. It nurtured and developed major fields like archaeology, meteorology and historiography in India. Sometimes we describe this is the oldest institute in this part of the globe, but it is ever young because in the stream of its researchers, scholars, always we find bright young men and women who find interest in rediscovering themselves. Achievements of this society have not only been glorious but pioneering as well, with its meaningful contributions towards human culture, social progress, international goodwill and understanding the Asiatic society has left no area of learning unexplored. To translate into action the set ideals of its founder, 
Even a cursory glance over the publications will convince one how very significant and valuable they are, always striking at refreshingly new things. English translation of Prince Dara Shikor's work on Sufism, Sutra Sutra of Asolayana, Dictionary of Lusai language, the upper atmosphere, the Kashmiri Ramayana, and many such other remarkable works may bear out the claims of the society as a pioneering research institution of national importance. Rabindranath once observed about the true aim of an academic institution. That is the real seat of learning where is going on a continued process for the creation of knowledge. Our society is a real seat of learning which is prompted for the quest of truth, for a proper dissemination of our culture, for a real advancement of knowledge, adding new dimensions to human wisdom. As I linger upon the archives of the Asiatic Society, I look at the piles of manuscripts and documents that remain in protective cover. I know that an antiquarian interest is hardly ever fashionable, even in academic circles. The endeavor, dedication and skill that it demands is extraordinarily high and the returns may not be quite so remunerative. Yes, I think of what drove those thousands of Englishmen who came to India as part of the East India Company in the 18th and 19th centuries. I mean, most of them were engaged in almost every other vocation as administrators, soldiers, traders, even sailors. And Indian scholars actually followed them to the Asiatic society. They made the pursuit of knowledge their unwavering concern and have left so much for posterity that we would all be poorer without their contribution. Surely you don't think that all future researchers will be Indian. Knowledge creates and invites a uniquely international community which has no respect for any geographical borders. That's why I came to India. You're right, Maya. The experience of more than two centuries of the Asiatic society not only supports what you say, but celebrates it. How else can India acknowledge William Jones or James Princep or Alexander Decorus? Unique among the treasures of the Asiatic society is the collection of copper plates, mostly used as legal document for transfer of land and property by kings to religious leaders like learned Brahmins and Buddhist monks for their service to the community. The Asiatic Society collection includes the unique visual experiences of Africa of the 18th century from British and European travelers. In pre-photography days, the only method to capture them was in painting. Asiatic Society's visual documentation of the African continent, therefore, contains some very rare paintings and sketches. Painting and sketching were among the basic skills of educated Europeans in pre-photography times and India's varied flora and fauna attracted those of whom who came here. Many of them were not professional painters but were highly skilled amateurs who left behind a significant body of work. The drawings of Buchanan, for instance, left behind are in itself a huge treasure trove. Its preservation by the Asiatic Society leaves us with an invaluable heritage of scientific information along with their artistic value.
My own research into colonial architecture drove me across the subcontinent. What I was pleasantly surprised to discover was that the Bombay Town Hall housed the Asiatic Society of Bombay. Formed in 1804 by Sir James Mackintosh, a jurist like William Jones, he was inspired by the example of his predecessor. Starting off with the Literary Society, they merged with the Anthropological and Geographical Societies of Bombay. Eventually, it became part of the British Royal Asiatic Society. Today, the Asiatic Society of Bombay proudly stores 100,000 books and 2,500 bound volumes of periodicals. The subjects are as varied as the languages in which they are written. Personally, I was more impressed by the visual documentation, with excellent sculptures that blend with the decor, with coins, paintings and other artifacts. The variety is a reminder that Bombay has been more of a melting pot of people and cultures than even Calcutta, and they are represented at the society. My other travels included Bangladesh. At the Nimtoli Diori in Dhaka, I was surprised to discover the youngest of them all, the Asiatic Society of Bangladesh, created along with this new nation. Leadership came from the noted archaeologist Ahmed Hassan Dani and linguist Mohammed Saidullah, among other scholars. The intention was to create their own platform for Asiatic studies, independent of other such institutions in the subcontinent. The interesting aspect of this organization is the emphasis that they placed on making this learning available in Bangla. Publications were largely in the mother tongue, though English translations were also made of seminal works to reach a wider audience. The Cultural Survey of Bangladesh was one such publication. I was quite impressed by its efforts at modernization and the inputs that had gone into creating a Banglapedia, both in print and on the World Wide Web. Of course, its English translation was more than welcome. I found the spirit of Jones and Horoprasad Shastri alive and active with the efforts of young scholars who continue to travel into the deepest corners of the country in search of historical artifacts and manuscripts. Though it is such a young nation, I was reminded that Bangladesh indeed has a long history of culture and erudition. The onslaught of time and the attacks from nature on the paintings has been severe. The task of restoration therefore has achieved serious proportions today. The Asiatic Society is fighting a relentless battle. This entails painstaking precision and specialized skills. Many of these restored paintings show high levels of inspired artistic effort. The responsibility of restoration has today fallen heavily on books as well because most of them contain the knowledge for which Asiatic society remains so important in our own times. A regular team of restorers are at work every day, carefully protecting the pages and ensuring the dangers of the unknown future. Many of the modern scientific and mechanized methods of restoration are not easily available, so Asiatic society continues to depend on high levels of human skill that they have acquired and trained. Publishing has always been a frontline activity for the Asiatic Society in disseminating knowledge. Scholarly works, latest findings and path-breaking discoveries in virtually all disciplines still engage the publishing effort. Participation in book fairs allows these books to reach the common people. So what would you say about the role the Asiatic Society plays today, particularly in terms of the current discourse between East and West? 
We know that the world is globalized. We know that East and West are impregnating each other. And we also know that uh, in the process there is a certain collapse of quality in the interests of quantity. That more and more is being learnt about less and less in terms of depth. So that's a general phenomenon. In practice, I'd say that the study of India as a whole, as a civilization, the Indic civilization, which stretches from central Afghanistan till about northern Burma and includes uh, the Himalayan cultures as well as uh, Sri Lanka, that sort of civilization, I'm not saying this in any imperial sense, I'm saying this in terms of a loose federational civilizational sense. That study has to be based on a, certainly the knowledge of facts, hard, solid facts, rationally argued. Mm -hmm. B, the languages in which the facts are posited, so that we should not study Indo-Islamic culture in terms of what the British said about it, but in terms of what the Mughals or the Turkis or the, um, the Bengalis or the Marathas said about their medieval past. We should go to the original primary sources and see in terms of an understanding that ethnicity and self-definitions uh, self of identity are far more important than religious ascription in a later modern age. That we can't talk of Hindu civilization or Muslim civilization or Muslim terrorism and by association Hindu terrorism, we should be thinking more in terms of what are the ethnic units and their self-definitions of identity and how they do not necessarily always want to form different political entities but are prepared to culturally federate and develop composite cultures. I'd say that if the Asiatic society has one task, it is to look at the compositeness of culture. My journey had begun with my interest in colonial architecture and the urgency to know how my ancestors traveled across thousands of miles of challenging ocean to build new worlds in a world away from home. India was my ultimate stop because it was a witness to the largest, widest and deepest intervention by British colonialists in the 18th and 19th centuries. I know that mercantile greed and imperial ambition brought my ancestors down these rivers, but I keep wondering what engaged generations of British intellectuals in the discovery of Asiatic learning. Well, Maya, sometimes I feel that the pursuit of knowledge is not restricted by political or mercantile interests, and it flows across boundaries. That is why the builders of the Asiatic society were able to bring the intellectual fervor the intellectual endeavour and the spirit of inquiry of the Enlightenment that they discovered on the banks of the Thames to here. And Indian scholars began their inquiry into the rest of Asia from the banks of the river Ganges. <laughs> Absolutely. It was the intermingling of two rivers and two civilizations. So the river is almost like a symbol of knowledge. The river is a symbol of knowledge. Quite fascinating. In fact, the metaphor of the river is really quite wider and deeper in meaning than just the accumulation of knowledge or even its points of assimilation. Like the river has its tributaries all along its given course. And it doesn't just take, it gives as well. I mean, it feeds its distributaries along the way. Just as knowledge is not just meant to be acquired, it's meant to be spread. And the ocean, of course, is the ultimate metaphor. You know, it accepts and welcomes all streams of knowledge. <laughs>